This is Nicosia, the capital of Cyprus. It's the last divided city in Europe. From up here, it's hard to see. But right through the center of Nicosia is a buffer zone. It cuts our island right through its heart, separating Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. It's a dead space of silence and soldiers. My dream is that this cut can be healed, that our lives can bond together again. I share that dream with my friend Michael. He's a Greek Cypriot like me. I also share it with Typhoon and Idil. They're Turkish Cypriots. Recently, we had a chance to share that dream with three wise old men, the elders. We learned many things with them. This is how it started. Sorry that we kept you waiting a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Tell me your name. Lee. Lee. And yours? Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Talia. Talia. And Michael. Michael. It's good to meet you all. What would you like to see about your island? I want to see it. One again, one whole island. It's small enough without dividing it. You, is that what you believe, all of you? Yeah, for everyone to be able to live together again and not be separated. Our homes, their homes. No borders. No, no green zone where you have to show passports. Yeah, that would be nice. Of course, we have got lots of expectations from them. They are the experts in helping conflicting communities come to terms. You, you, they look alike, I mean, mm -hmm. skin color. <laughs> and you too, I mean... Uh, We're Cypriot. Huh? Eh? Cypriot. Yeah. So the first thing I heard was Archbishop's laughter, and it just oh, got me into... I mean, I was having fits of laughter. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> That's how he's like? Nobel Peace Prize and he can be so open and happy with everybody. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when he, as soon as he starts speaking, nothing else reaches to your ears except of his voice. How does your family feel about this missing person? Well, my dad's uncle was lost before my dad was born, so they gave his name to my dad. So even though my dad doesn't know him, he has an emotional connection to him because he's carrying his name. They had experience, they had advice, they had stories to share. Throughout these days, they've inspired us with their experience, their knowledge, their understanding about conflicts. Almost everywhere in the world, when, when somebody has been killed, and, and buried uh, or, or disappeared. I mean, in Argentina, Chile, they all have the same longing. <laughs> what happened to our loved one? All, the, all of them want to know. I mean, in, in Northern <coughs> Ireland, even now, the, the cry is, what happened? 
I read in the, on the site that you were the special representative of the Secretary General, right? Yeah. How was it? Is it stressful? Uh, well, it's <laughs> busy. <laughs> on the bus, I was having this hour-long conversation with uh, Mr. Brahimi about anything you could think of. My family, mm. they had 16 missing people. 16, one six. And uh, 15 of them were found dead. Mm. And one of them is still missing. Mm. And uh, they went through a lot of atrocities in the war. And I wanted to ask you, how do people get over that? You know, I think you've got to ask yourself questions. What are the options mm -hmm. that are offered to you? Um, there was um, in, in Gaza a doctor, uh, a Palestinian doctor. Was very, who was working for an Israeli television. Mm. And uh, the Israelis killed his family. So, of course, he was very angry and so on. But then, you know, he said, uh, if we go on by this, what will happen? Other people will lose their families. That's what will happen. President Carter, um, it's easy to understand his president because when he starts to talk, his voice changes like, like a president. I noticed that nothing Nothing can escape from him. He, whatever we've said over these days, he remembers every single detail. Ah. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> so uh, we had here information about the well. There is a well down there. Uh, that human remains were located inside. Finished. No, we haven't finished yet. We found the bottom a few days ago. Mm. It's uh, water. You found what? The bottom of the well. Okay. And uh, there is still water, some water inside. We we are pumping that water out, mm -hmm. and the mud we take with buckets, we are sieving it. I will show you the sieving mm -hmm. place there, uh -huh. Uh -huh. with water, so we can find out if there is any remains there or not. Do you do you have bad dreams? Uh, not actually, because this is a, we see this as a very positive world. Yes. It sounds like we are finding bones, but uh, we see that it's a very good thing we do for our country. Yes. So you don't have nightmares? No, it's, it's, uh, when you have the first contact with the job, with the work here, it's sometimes difficult, but after yes. you have the experience, it's easier. There were two girls, Steven Dia, remains looking for bones, I believe that you are doing something holy for the families of the missing people. Frankly, it amazed me. I mean, if they told me to sit in mud and sieve the mud for eight hours a day, I'd think that they were kidding offering me a job like that. When did you start doing this job? Uh, two months ago. Yes, I'm new. Are you still emotional while doing it or did you get used to it? I'm used to it. Okay, I'm sometimes emotional, but I know that I have to do it. Yes. Do you have any missing person in your family? Has he or she been found? No, not yet. I didn't know that this job depended so much on human labor. I thought it was done more by machines or vehicles. I can see now how people struggle to find the bones and I have a missing person in my own family as well. I hope he can be taken out and buried as well. of healing and which makes most I think in my experience most feel a kind of compassion for the others 
there may be some, I think, who say, well, we, we want to <coughs> revenge. Uh, but most, most people are incredible, are remarkable, actually. Immediately after your uh, son or husband or brother or sister or disappears, of course, you, you are hopeful that they will be alive. And if you think that they are dead, you know, the, perhaps the feeling of, of revenge is more common than the feeling of forgiveness. You, you don't need to either forget or even forgive. You know, somebody who has killed my son, I will not, I will not forgive him or her. But I think that with, with time, I realized that the way to honor and remember my, my child is not by killing other kids. Yeah, I will not forget, I will not forgive, uh, but I will not kill anymore, you see. This I'm, is... not so, I'm not sure, mm. Mm. my dear. Mm. I would also want to take issue with, with you on saying I, I, I will not forgive. Almost all of the people that we, we encountered in our Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, were amazing and I, I, I think at the moment what you're saying is cerebral. The, the for, not forgetting is quite crucial because you're saying <coughs> with a I will not forget. Remembering is important actually for the process of healing. So I think the main purpose of this exhumation and the identification of, of the lost ones is a matter of uh, resolving the past as best we can, but primarily building on the future so that the Turks and Greeks both realize uh, that here in Cyprus we lost loved ones. The suffering was equal on both sides. Both sides are to blame. That's coming out of this. Uh, this whole process, and now what do we do with this knowledge? We build for peace in the future. We shouldn't make generalizations. <clears throat> there are some people, yes, who killed, but some who didn't. And those who live today, those who are our friends, are definitely not one of them. It's like we're, we're, we're suffering because of the mistakes of the past other generations made. And you don't want your, don't you want or your children to, to repeat these mistakes. Right. You don't want you or your children or grandchildren to no. suffer just because mistakes were made in the past by both sides. Exactly. One one of the things is that when you look when you look at the world, in those situations where people engage in revenge, for one thing, the revenge does not. I mean, revenge does not restore the situation that was before. I mean, it doesn't restore your son. And, uh, and, and, and the thing that happens, I mean, when you look at Israel and Palestine, you have a, a suicide bomber go into Israel. You know that there's going to be a reprisal yes. uh, against the Palestinians. But as sure as anything, you know too that uh, somewhere along the line the Palestinians are going to do something again. Yes. And so you have this spiral that just goes on and on and on. It was quite important to, for us to see this their side and realize that it's not just storytelling the things we hear they, they, they've actually happened they actually exist it was important to see that both Greek Cypriots and Turkey Cypriots work together on these sites to digging the past and um, the elders I think they were quite impressed by this when do you think this site was formed? In 74? In 74, actually, this site was a river valley starting from here. Oh, really? And reaching till the sea. Oh. So it was uh, way different than oh. now you see today. Is this a natural burial place? Yes, and it was uh, in a remote place, away mm -hmm. from the Kyrenia. Ah. So a perfect place to, 
to this kind of uh, yeah, dispose of body. Exactly, exactly. Very. Nice how, how many? How many uh, remains were? Two years ago, we found at our first excavations 38 Greek Cypriot missing persons here. But our information kept coming and coming that we should expect more here. We did trenches in this area, we did here. This area was very important for us because it was close to the small forest there which gave us the mm -hmm. 38 missing persons that we... I oh, think you found them yes. with the trees, yes. trees there? down there we found them first 30, time. Yes, 38, 38 people. It's a long process. Now, this is the biggest excavation that CMP is doing. Hmm. Three years, big machines, hmm. a big That's machine right. power, manpower, and it's very important and it will continue more. The two places had exactly the same atmosphere. They were on different sides, but everything apart from it was the same. So it was not much different from the other. They are doing the same job. It doesn't matter on which side they're doing it. So we are a proof here that two different ethnic groups on this yeah. island. Cypriots, we say, I mean, we don't separate ourselves. Cypriots can work together in a project like this or in a bigger projects. Where do you usually get the information about the bones? Like there, there are bones, so let's... So you can get information basically from anyone. I mean, rumors, someone who witnessed, someone who was in the event actually, did it, yes. And another sensible point here for us as a CMP is uh, we are not dealing actually with who killed yeah, right. or how they killed. It's, mm. it's a matter out of our uh, job. Yeah. We want to recover the missing persons and give them back to their families. And other side of the job needs other authorities. How do you feel when you find bones of somebody that you know uh, could be related to your family or could be related to your friends or generally that uh, compatriots and have you ever come in con into contact with one of those families that has found the remnants of uh, their members? You feel this pain in you, I mean, when you reach the bones or you start <coughs> recovering them because uh, you remember that this was a living being once. He had a family, he had a life, he had dreams. You feel the sadness inside you. It doesn't matter who he is or from where he's coming. Another thing for this is the professionality. You mm -hmm. don't give yourself a lot to your feelings. You shouldn't do this. It's, it's not the professional way. Feel it, keep it inside you, but at a level and show respect to the remains. So the elders and these young people here have the same prayer for the future, mm -hmm. that there never be another uh, armed conflict, nobody else ever gets buried and killed and buried, and that this uh, exhumation that you are undertaking uh, with great uh, patience and tenacity mm -hmm. is a very important uh, opportunity for both Greek and Turkish Cypriots to realize that both sides suffered horribly. And that now is a time not for looking back with anger and, and, and uh, animosity and hatred, but looking forward to friendship. Head of the love. Good morning. And the You're the head? Yes. You're so young. <laughs> oh. And then this is deputy head of the love. Here is where we do the main analysis uh, of the remains that we receive from the field. So when we receive the remains, the first thing we do is we, we try to wash them and reconstruct all the, the pieces. Uh, here we have one site that it consists of approximately 40 individuals 
and we had around 15,000 bones, bone fragments and teeth that we had to associate to 40 individuals. Um, we do that, the first stage, we, uh, we try through anthropological means to associate two group bones together. From what part do you get the, D, the best DNA? From the teeth, usually. Teeth, teeth. Yes. And, and that's the most durable, no? Yes, the teeth because it's very well protected in the yeah. sockets and the uh, teeth. Yeah. How long does it take to put the pieces together? It depends on the state of the remains when we, they are received. If they are very fragmented, if they are found commingled in the ground, uh, mixed together, or if they are found in anatomical order, and also the amount of uh, individuals represented. So it can vary between two, three days to five, six months. So we group together uh, some of the we managed to articulate, for example, the humerus with the ulna and the radius, and then we sent um, teeth from the skull that gave us the name of this individual, and we sent from the from here from the tibia, and also from the humerus. So we cut one piece, mm -hmm. and the DNA told us that this group, this skull, and this group belong to this individual. So we checked if the age was consistent, if uh, the articulations were good, um, the stature, and we confirmed that yes, everything is consistent with the genetic data. And so now we are in the process of identifying all these, um, we're at the final stages. <coughs> this is perimortem trauma, trauma around the time of death. Um, we record this and we explain to the families uh, what we see mm -hmm. uh, and we tell them if it's consistent <coughs> with a gunshot wound or if it's consistent with a blunt force. And this is a, a gunshot wound? Yes. Yes. Sorry. I was down when I saw the uh, gun hole in the remains and then I decided to look around to escape from the gun hole and I saw another one as a part of another remain and another one I saw three of them and most of them were not only one hole but more. The families have the opportunity to come here and to um, discuss with the geneticists, the archaeologists and the anthropologists all the procedures that were conducted and at that stage we feel rewarded on, on what we do emotionally. How do you feel working both Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots together to do this? There is no difference. Um, the, we don't see one another as Greek Cypriot or Turkish Cypriots. We are just one, one group of um, anthropologists and we are trying to do our best for this project. Because as soon as you got outside the building, Thalia called the three of us and said, guys, I don't want this to happen to us. I don't want this to happen again. Please, if it's about to happen so, please stop it. I don't know if we are strong enough to stop it, but it's definitely that we will try because we don't want any other missing people or any deaths. I, I don't think I would allow whatever I, whatever I can do to, for anything like that to happen again. I can't imagine for us doing this to each other again. I think that was the the most special part of everything. Nice to meet you. You are very, very beautiful. Very spirit. Pleasure. How are you? It was just like the conclusion, um, how uh, two people, one Greek Cypriot and one Turkish Cypriot, were sitting next to each other and were talking about their each of their father's death and they were okay about it. Um, he, was, uh, he was a manager of the Barclays Bank branch in, in Varosha, 
um, and he basically was, uh, they came from the, all accounts. We, we've never had an official account of what happened, so we don't know what happened uh, exactly and how it happened, but in May of 1964, it was after the 1963 troubles and after the, you know, the Turks and, and, and Greek Cypriots kind of moved away and into their own enclaves. Uh, there, there were attacks on Turkish Cypriots, who, civilians who were living, uh, who were working in the predominantly Greek Cypriot areas. Um, my father was one of those people. We know that people came to the bank and they took him from there and basically he disappeared. Mm -hmm. And we haven't heard from him. Uh, Obviously, over the years, uh, there were, as the relations, personal relations, through personal relations, uh, we found out what happened to him unofficially. So we had absolutely no expectation that he was alive and he was going to come back one day. So we knew this information in the, in, in the 60s. Uh, the biggest revelation was us when I got a phone call saying that, you know, he's you know, his, uh, the burial place has been located and all of a sudden they're basically moving in to exhume the bodies because apparently somebody was going to build some uh, holiday home because it's a seaside resort in Ainapa. So the CMP, uh, you know, did this exhumation. So that was a very emotional moment. It's actually happening because I never thought in my lifetime that I was actually going to be in that position of actually recovering my... because there was so much... Uh, it was, it was an impossible thing that one day when I was growing up that it was going to happen because ev all forces were against it. Nobody wanted to, this thing to come to, to, to you know, uh, come out in the open. Uh, everybody was trying to kind of keep it under both sides because they didn't want to own up to their responsibilities and they were all both at, you know, at fault. Mm -hmm. so My father was a civilian, he was a judge. And during the second phase of the, of the invasion of the Turkish army, in Cyprus, we got sort of isolated in the peninsula of Carpasia as the Turkish uh, troops were marching down. Uh, from what I have gathered, I know that the International Association of, of, of Judges managed to talk to, at the time, Prime Minister of Turkey, Ejovid, who sent a message to the, uh, to the Turkish Cypriot leader at the time, Dektas, and he got the reply that I'm afraid that we've lost the judge, which means he was killed by the uh, local uh, militia. So that was the first official, uh, let's say, uh, information that we have, an admission that my father was, was executed. Of course, year after year, we were receiving uh, information, some not uh, factually based, some of them factually based, but after some year, we, 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 we realized that there was no chance for him to be alive. Cyprus is a small place, even if there was a divide by the time. Um, there were strong feelings, as far as we found out from the Turkey Cypriots at the time, and particularly the militia, against the Greek Cypriots of the area. It was actually probably a very local thing that happened, a, a very local act of revenge. And coming here and, and seeing it, and it was like uh, looking at uh, you know the bones and uh, you know the remains and with the uh, holes here and there. It, it was it was very emotional. Uh, and also, I got quite uh, angry about the whole situation. I mean, it's something that personally I still cannot process with it because it's a murder. Why? Why was my father killed? It is quite all right to continue to be angry because your father has been killed, because that, that was wrong and it doesn't stop being wrong. You see, the fact that you are going to reconcile does not stop the fact. You don't have to, to, to change that feeling that killing my father was wrong and the people who, who have done it are criminals. Thank you that you want to share with us uh, the, your trauma. The empathy that uh, exists between you two uh, gives very great hope uh, for, your, for, your, for your island home. So many people keep those feelings of animosity bottled up and uh, even the most sane person would explode at some point. And the fact that they're willing to work together and buy communal activities is remarkable. I think we all thought 
people who lost relatives from their immediate family were only filled with hatred, anger. But now sitting here, they can say, I was very little. I know very little about my father. But what can we do in the future? I'm very moved. Thank you. I must say, felt like it closed a whole period of mixed emotions and huge stress and, uh, and bitterness. And I hope the rest of the missing persons, uh, families, be as, as lucky as, as, if I may say so, as we are in our, let's say, unluckiness. But there is something else at stake. A lot of things have happened. Now, we've got to make sure that this does not happen again in our island. And for that, we've got to move on. Do you think if families who share the same stories from both sides are made to come together, do you think it would relieve the atmosphere or would it make it even worse? Um, I think uh, there are different, I mean, there are, not all families, not all relatives are like Spiros and I. So I think we are probably a minority, I would say. I think there's a great majority of people who have lost their, uh, you know, fa family members who are still feeling a lot of uh, animosity towards each other. Let's not paint a very, you know, kind of a, a rosy picture here, you know. Uh, you know, we, we are an initiative and we are, you know, moving forward, we, we are an NGO, but, uh, and we are coming together, but I would say that we are probably a minority and there are a lot of people who will not even look at each other. And I think that trust thing is, 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 is the key here. So trust helps the reunification process and the reconciliation, and, but how do you get that trust for as long as people are not talking to each other? That's the challenge. Two people who have gone through the trauma of losing each a father, uh, and instead of being consumed by bitterness and hatred, uh, have have come together to form uh, this group that seeks to help in the healing process for Cyprus. Well, to return to Cyprus again, after we've been here, this is the third trip, it's very um, remarkable to see the changes that have been made. I think this has been exemplified more than anything else by the presence of these four remarkable young people, two from the northern part, two from the southern part, who've now bonded together in a spirit of uh, mutual exchange, mutual friendship, mutual respect, mutual understanding of what they're parents and grandparents have been through and to utilize the latest scientific development in, in anthropology and forensic science to extract um, remains from wells in the north and south that contain the um, bodies of uh, Greek Cypriots and, and Turkish Cypriots that have been slain by the other side and then to see the families reunited with their loved ones uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years later has been a very emotional experience for the young people and for us. I think what we have learned here, first of all, tells us that uh, there are a lot of hurdles still. Uh, there is uh, a lot of resistance to a solution. But there is also, on the other hand, a lot of very, very serious work being done by a lot of people at all levels who want to get to a solution, want to solve the problems of this country and uh, create the uh, united Cyprus that uh, you have all dreamed for in this, in, 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 in this country. With young people who have been incredible, I mean, quite, uh, quite impressive, uh, from two from each of your communities, and, and they have grown to accept one another in a way that seems to be a, an image 
of what in fact is possible in, in this country. I think I realized through this is that the, the book of the past cannot close if, if you don't find out what's in it. It has changed my vision of the future and vision of the past. And then we go away, I mean, uh, uh, even more certain that we ought to be going to buy our tickets for uh, when we return to celebrate uh, a, a united Cyprus. <laughs>